So let's read Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. We don't read too much now in Ephesians because I want to make the connection with the book of Acts and other passages. Ephesians 1, verse, three, verse 1 to 3. Paul, apostle of Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus, by God's will to the saints and faithful in Christ Jesus who are at Ephesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ. So far the reading of the scriptures. I just have to see if my recorder works because otherwise I have to take another recorder. I'm not sure. This is a wonderful epistle. You can say this is really the highlight of Paul's ministry. And when you see who was used by God to write this epistle, then you're even more amazed. This was the greatest enemy. How can that be? He was a very religious person. When you look in the history of Acts, you see how this man was persecuting the Christians. The Jewish believers who had put their trust in the Lord Jesus. But the Lord Jesus was rejected by his people. And that was foreseen already in the Old Testament, that his own people would reject him. And the Lord Jesus was not surprised by that rejection. We know it from many scriptures. But my point is now that this rejection was then continued even after the Lord Jesus was already glorified. So the Lord Jesus was rejected by his people. They accused him of blasphemy. They had him crucified by the Romans. And then the Lord Jesus died. But he rose again. Today is the day of his resurrection. And not only that, he was exalted at God's right hand. And from there he sent the Holy Spirit. And then a new ministry started by the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus had worked for three and a half years publicly on this earth. And now... From heaven, he continued his ministry in a different way. And in the context of that ministry, we see that he called Saul of Tarsus. Saul of Tarsus, when you read 1 Timothy 1, you see that he calls himself the greatest of all sinners. This grace of God reached out to him. Why was he the greatest of all sinners? He, the very religious Jew, you can read it in Philippians 3, he persecuted God's own people. There you see that religion, many people think religion is okay. You know, the first one on this earth who was very, uh, very much in religion was Cain. And what did he do? He killed his own brother. In the name of religion, many people have been killed. And in that context, we see Saul of Tarsus. He was killing his fellow Jews and brought them to justice, want to have them killed because they were followers of the rejected Jesus of Nazareth. That's the issue. Jesus of Nazareth, he is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. And you know what is so remarkable? If you turn with me to Acts 9, when the Lord Jesus called uh, Saul of Tarsus, he was on this journey uh, close to Damascus, and then we read in Acts 9, verse 3, suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. It was like lightning. And he was blinded by that light. And then he fell on his face to the ground and he heard a voice. The voice was saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Verse 5, and he said, who art thou, Lord? Instinctively and instantaneously, he recognized the Lord Jesus as Lord. The one who he was persecuting, the one who was uh, rejecting, he recognized him now as Lord. And then the Lord said, I am Jesus. Whom thou persecutest. By the way, that implies also the secret of the link between Christ in heaven and the believers on this earth. He is the head, the believers, the body. And so Paul, Saul of Tarsus, was persecuting the believers on this earth, and in this way he persecuted Christ himself, because Christ is the head of the body. And this truth is then later worked out in Paul's ministry. What we see then in verse uh, Trembling and astonished, he said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? 
And that's important for us too. Lord, what will thou have me to do? To recognize him as Lord, he's in charge. To make ourselves available to him. That is what we see with Saul of Tarsus. He's following the instructions that the Lord gave him. And then he meets, in the three days of darkness that he spends there in Damascus, he meets Ananias. Ananias was sent by the Lord to this place. And there he spoke to Saul and he laid hands on him. Before he went there, the Lord said in verse 15, Go thy way, he speaks to Ananias, Go thy way, for he, that's Saul of Tarsus, is a chosen vessel unto me. For what purpose? To bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. So Saul of Tarsus was a chosen vessel by the Lord to send him to the Gentiles. That was a no-no for the Jews. But also to the children of Israel. He spoke also to the Jews. And he even wrote uh, Hebrews to them later. But that was connected with sufferings. It says in verse 16, I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And so Ananias went and he said, Saul, brother. And then he was healed immediately. We see then in verse 19 that he uh, got a meal and was strengthened. But he was also spiritually strengthened. Because from that moment on in verse 20, straightway he preached Jesus so they rejected Jesus in the King James it says Christ, but we should read Jesus. They rejected Jesus of Nazareth. He is the Son of God. That is what Saul now preached. What was rejected by the Jews, that he was the Son of God, he preached it now. Because now Saul had understood this is true. It's not blasphemy. And he also preached him as the Messiah in verse 22 proving, at the end of verse 22, proving that this is very Christ. That means he is the Messiah. You know, John's Gospel was written, and we saw that when we finished John's Gospel, John 20, these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. That means the Anointed One, the Son of God. So he is both. It's a mystery. He is the Messiah, rejected by the Jews. He's the Son of God that was also rejected by the Jews. But this is now what Saul of Tarsus is preaching. He was saved. There was a tremendous change. And he made himself available to the Lord Jesus, who is now in heaven, crowned with glory and honor. In, in connection with Ephesians, I want to point also to chapter 22, Acts 22, where we have another detail where Ananias spoke to uh, Saul when he visited him. In Acts 22... When Ananias was speaking, okay, verse 14, he said, The God of our fathers has chosen thee that thou shouldst know his will. This is the message that Ananias gave on behalf of the Lord to Saul of Tarsus, that Saul of Tarsus would know God's will. And the subject of God's will is very prevalent in Ephesians, as we hope to see. And then to see the just one, the Lord Jesus is the just one, the righteous one, and he would see him. Saul of Tarsus was the only one who saw him from the glory. That's a very important point. And then he shared that with the others. He went to Jerusalem to share this and they accepted that later. But my point is he saw the just one as he is now in heaven. On earth, he did not see him as far as we know. The 12 apostles who became apostles, the 12 disciples, they saw the Lord Jesus three and a half years. But they saw the just one. But now the just one is in heaven, and from heaven he appeared to Saul of Tarsus. Now we have to understand that these two points go together. The Lord Jesus appearing to Saul from the glory links this with the twelve, the message of the twelve. That is so important. You can study, if you make a note, you can study in Galatians chapter 1 and 2, where Paul explains it in detail how he had received his ministry from the Lord Jesus in heaven, and how he shared that with the disciples in Jerusalem, with Peter, with John, and others there, and also James. And they accepted that. They saw that this is from God. And so they recognized that rejected, uh, this, this persecutor who rejected the Christians was now saved and was sent by the Lord Jesus with this mission. So the Lord Jesus appeared to him, he gave him this mission, and he would know more of his will.
And I want to apply that to us also. The Lord Jesus wants us to know him. He wants to make himself known to us. He has given the Holy Spirit. He has given the word of God so that we may know more of him and have this relationship with him, a direct relationship with the Lord Jesus in heaven and us here on earth. It's the same as you find here in the book of Acts and you find in the New Testament, that link between the Lord and the glory and the believers on this earth, that link is still there for us to enjoy. And so if you would read Acts 26, we find more details how God gave a special ministry to Saul of Tarsus to open the eyes of the blind. His own eyes had been opened. And God was going to use him to open other blind eyes. That is part of this ministry. It would be interesting to study Acts 26 in detail. Let's go back to Ephesians 1. When Paul wrote Ephesians, that was not immediately. When he had uh, received instructions from the Lord in the glory, he was for three years in the wilderness in uh, Arabia. Then he went back to Damascus and then he was persecuted, went back to Jerusalem, was uh, reluctantly received there. And then his life was in danger again. You can see it at the end of Acts 9. And he had to flee to Tarsus, went back to where he used to live. In the meantime, the Lord was forming him for this service. And then much later, when the gospel went out to Antioch, uh, Barnabas went there. Barnabas went from Jerusalem. You can read it in Acts 11. And he was rejoicing in the grace of God. Barnabas saw what God had been doing there. The Gentiles got saved. There were Jewish people got saved. Gentiles got saved. There was a, an assembly formed. And then Barnabas, Barnabas realized, I have to get help. He got help. He went to Saul of Tarsus, there in Tarsus, that is now present-day Turkey, and he brought him to Antioch. And both ministered there for a whole year in the assembly. Imagine, you would have ministry meetings every day and uh, learn more from the Lord Jesus. It's amazing. And they were growing by leaps and bounds. They were then also establishing the fellowship between the believers in Jerusalem, uh, Barnabas, and um, later went on to bring money for the poor in uh, in Jerusalem, you find that in Acts 11 and 12. And then after that, he went back to Antioch. And then he was called by the Lord to be sent with Barnabas to the Gentiles. And you read that in Acts 13 and 14, the first missionary journey. And then when Paul came back to, Jeru to uh, Antioch, there was a problem because of the Judaizers, and they had that problem settled in Jerusalem. And so that's Acts 15. But then Paul wanted to go back to visit the assemblies that had been formed there in Turkey, province, the Roman province of Galatia, and he wanted to strengthen them and help them, which he did. He was also a pastor. He had the heart of a shepherd. So he was an apostle sent by the Lord. He was a teacher, as Barnabas was, but certainly Paul in a very special way. And there he went back to the assemblies to teach them because there was a wrong doctrine coming in right there. Already. Then, at the end of the second journey, see Paul goes from Corinth. You can read that at the end of Acts 18. But then he didn't stay there. They wanted to have him stay there. He said, if the Lord wills, I come back. So he went back to Jerusalem, first to Antioch, then to Jerusalem. You can see that in Acts 18. And then he went on a third journey. The second journey was with Silas and uh, Timothy joined him and also uh, Luke. For, for some time. But the third journey he started alone and then he went to Ephesus. And there he found those disciples. And that's now the connection with Ephesians. There he found disciples of John the Baptist who had not known anything about what happened in the Lord's life. They knew that the Lord Jesus was the Messiah, but they didn't know what happened after that. And so Paul asked, did you receive, did you receive the Holy Spirit? They didn't even know that the Holy Spirit had come. They got saved, they, got, they received the Holy Spirit, and that was the beginning of the assembly in Ephesus. There were 12 Jewish men. And then Paul went to the synagogue, and he could preach in the synagogue for three months. That was amazing. Usually he would be kicked out after two or three Sabbaths, but they kept him for three months and listening, and he was teaching them in the synagogue. And many got saved also from the Gentile believers who had become proselytes or who were also in the synagogue. But then 
they had to go he had to go out of the synagogue and he started a work in that city that is the city Ephesus was the city of idolatry of occultism that was the stronghold of the enemy right there God says I put my assembly you know in Matthew 18 the Lord says the gates of Hades will not overcome will not prevail my assembly and so there in the scene of darkness idolatry and immorality but placed his church you find that in Acts 19 it's an amazing work that the triumph of God's grace how people got saved and delivered from the power of Satan and so there you have that assembly and Paul stayed there for three years amazing there were two years that could preach in the school of Tyrannus now that was in in those days during the noon uh, hour the noon hour during the siesta the break that people would take to rest it was warm at that time of the day and then Paul used that opportunity to speak in the school of Tyrannus you find that also in Acts 19 it's interesting Tyrannus is really the name of the philosopher who was teaching there or perhaps it was an, a sports school we don't know this name means tyrant that is really a name of Satan Satan had a stronghold there in Ephesus he was the tyrant to control these people and now God sent Paul of Tarsus to deliver the people from that bondage to set them free and also to deliver the Jewish people from the bonds of Judaism they have that new assembly that was a brilliant act of God it was a beautiful work of God that had started there there was much opposition of course but the Lord continued and that ministry continued the word went out through all of the province of Asia the Roman province of Asia where we have later other assemblies like Colossae and um, Thyatira Sardis Smyrna and so here in this assembly we find Saul of Tarsus Paul the Apostle Paul and there he speaks now this epistle was written later not at the, the end of the third journey you know what happened when Paul had visited the assembly in Ephesus after that he went back to the area of um, Corinth he went to Macedonia went back to Corinth and there he wrote the epistle to the Romans and I just want to see you that connection in Romans 16 Paul was writing that epistle at the end of his uh, journey before he went back to Jerusalem he wrote Romans and there he mentioned at the end of Romans 16 verse 24 the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all amen and then he adds a doxology verse 25 now to him has power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known to all nations for obedience of faith to God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever amen that is the doxology that is the praise that God brings to that Paul brings to God God is the one who sent Paul to preach the gospel and Paul he shows here there is more than the gospel God was uh, giving uh, Paul as a teacher and so Paul also explained what the gospel is here in Romans he was a teacher to explain all about the gospel he preached the gospel taught the gospel but here he shows that God had even more to say and that is Romans 16 25 it's really a reference to the mystery you know this word mystery we have 28 times in the New Testament so four times seven times 21 times three times seven times in Paul's writings that's amazing so Paul was really initiated the mysteries of God and that is the connection with Romans 6 in the end and Ephesians because in Ephesians explains this mystery all the depths and the height of it if you come to uh, chapter 3 you find more details about it but the whole epistle is really about that mystery it is Christ in heaven glorified connected with the believers on this earth that is a mystery and that is what Paul had been privileged to receive from God to communicate and so when we go to Ephesians 1 verse 1 we find he introduces himself it's not to put himself on a pedestal it's just to identify who is speaking here in Hebrews he doesn't do that I'm convinced Hebrews was written by Paul but there he's not important as apostle there he is a teacher he takes the writings of the Old Testament and explains them in connection with the Lord Jesus but here 
has to introduce himself an apostle because he, he was sent from the Lord and the glory to show this new revelation, this mystery. In Hebrews, he does not bring out new revelations. He delves in the scriptures in the Old Testament to show the treasures about the Lord Jesus. But here as an apostle, sent by the Lord from the glory, he had this authority as an apostle sent by the Lord. And so he identifies himself as such. Paul means small or little. He had to become little in his own eyes before the Lord could use him. We have to become little in our own eyes before the Lord can use us. We have a natural tendency to put ourselves on a pedestal, to think great of ourselves. But as long as Paul was thinking great of himself, God couldn't use him. But when he had become small in the Lord's presence, now the Lord could use him and send him. And we have men mentioned a few uh, missions that he accomplished. So apostle means sent one. Of course, the Lord Jesus himself was the great apostle sent by God on this earth. And in Hebrews 3, we see that the Lord Jesus is now the apostle who communicate God's thoughts through his spirit to us even today. The apostle means here with the authority that God had given him. The authority now that comes from the Lord in the glory. So I said earlier, the Lord on this earth called the twelve disciples to be his apostles, his sent ones. We see that in Acts 1, the Lord sent them. What is an additional element and very important to see, now the Lord from the glory sends another apostle. That is not a contradiction with the others, but it is to work together with them. Because what the Lord Jesus established with the twelve in Acts 1 after his resurrection, and which was then followed up in Acts 2, this is then connected with what came from Acts 9 and onwards in Paul's ministry. There is a close connection, but there is also a great distinction. The apostles were sent from the Lord on this earth, whereas Paul was sent from the Lord in the glory. But my point is now, they work together. There is not a conflict of interest. The, people, the, false, the Judaizers wanted to create a conflict of interest. They would say, well, you know, the twelve apostles there in Jerusalem, they are the ones. They have the authority. The Saul guy who believes in him. They despised Saul of Tarsus. And even today, the ministry of Paul is despised in many quarters. They don't want Paul. This is important to realize that the two go together. The twelve sent by the Lord on this earth goes together with the one sent by the Lord from the glory. And the one who was sent by the Lord from the glory, he did all the efforts necessary to work together with them. In Galatians 1 and 2, I mentioned already, in other places you can't find that. He worked together with them. So he was a sent one. Application for us. We are also sent ones. Did you know that? The Lord has taken us out of this world and he sent us into this world to be his uh, missionaries, to be his sent ones. Apostle means sent one. That is a parallel. The contrast is we did not see the Lord in the glory as Paul did. We are connected with the Lord in the glory, of course. But we did not see him. We did not receive that same mission with that same authority. But there is a parallel we represent the Lord Jesus here in this world, just as Paul represented him. There's a parallel. Then in verse 1 it says, uh, Apostle of Jesus Christ. I believe th there's other manuscripts that say Christ Jesus, which would be more correct. The point is, the Lord was made Lord and Christ. Peter refers to that in Acts 2, 33, when Peter was speaking of the day of Pentecost. He spoke of the Lord Jesus, who is now in heaven, the rejected Messiah, he is now in heaven, and he said, the Lord has made him, God has made him Lord and Christ. He has all authority, Lord, and he is the anointed one. God anointed him. And that's important for us to understand too. The Lord Jesus was anointed on this earth when the Holy Spirit came on his, the day that he was baptized by John the Baptist, the Lord rose from the waters of Jordan, and then the Holy Spirit rested on him and stayed on him, remained on him. He was anointed. Peter refers to an extent that the Lord Jesus was anointed. That is Christ, the anointed one. But then, when Peter speaks in Acts 2, he speaks of the Lord Jesus, that God made him Lord and Christ. That means he was anointed again. There in heaven, there's now a man in heaven. And God had anointed this man on this earth. And now the Lord... The Lord was received, the Lord Jesus was received by God. He was saluted by God, Hebrews 5. And God anointed him there with the Holy Spirit. A man in the glory 
anointed by the Holy Spirit. And that unction went down to the earth where you see the Holy Spirit come down. There is a link that unction went to the disciples on the earth through the Holy Spirit. And so that is how the Holy Spirit linked the believers on this earth with the Lord Jesus in heaven. And today, the moment we have believed, God has introduced us into a realm. We have been brought into a realm that's characterized by the Holy Spirit, where the Lord Jesus is recognized as the Anointed One, and where we are His disciples, His representative on this earth, where He's still rejected. So we have been ushered into the same relationship, and this will go on till the rapture. If someone is saved today, he is introduced in that same community, that same relationship, and so that is ongoing. It started the day of Pentecost, and this is ongoing till the rapture. So the moment we are saved, we have been introduced into that realm where the Holy Spirit is everything. Lord Jesus is everything, because the Holy Spirit represents the Lord Jesus Christ as he is now in heaven. And he wants us to be immersed in these things. And that goes together with the will of God. It's interesting that I mentioned earlier in Acts 22 that um, Paul was to know the will of God. It says here, through the will of God, that expression, through the will of God, we have seven times in Paul's writings, and the word will is seven times in Ephesians. My point is now this. This is all according to the will of God. There is nothing of man. And Paul makes that very clear in Galatians 1 and 2, that he did not, he was not sent by man, he was not organizing things according to man's mind. It was all of the Lord and the glory and by God. And so he is now an apostle of Christ Jesus, the anointed one in heaven, and sent according or through the will of God. So that's important. This is nothing of man. Today, people want to be people. Paul says in Galatians 1, am I here to please man? If we are here to please man, we have a conflict with God's interest. God is not here to please man. God is here to have his will recognized and honored. Of course, God wants to bless, but it is according to his ideas, not according to our ideas. So the will of God rules out man's will and man's uh, preferences. But then also, what does he write? He's, he addresses this to, it's very important to see that, the saints here is those who have been set apart. The word saint means you are one set apart, sanctified, set apart for God according to his will. That is God's idea of uh, sanctifying. And we have more details, of, of course, in other scriptures. This is now the position that we have. We have been set apart, and that implies an ongoing process in our lives to be sanctified to make ourselves available to the Lord. That's our side. But here it is God's side. God has set us apart for himself. We are here for him. It then also says in that verse, so these were the believers who were in Ephesus, and we talked a little bit about Ephesus in Acts 19. And when you would connect it with Acts 20, we see that Paul came back at the end of that third journey, and he greeted them before he went to Jerusalem, and he spoke to them in Acts 20. And that's a very important message where Paul refers to the fact that God had uh, given through Paul to those believers in Ephesus the whole counsel of God. Acts 20, where Paul gives this summary of his ministry. He had worked there for three years with tears and persecutions. Actually, there was that great riot at the end of chapter 19. But Paul had been preaching, preaching there and testifying there in Acts 20, verse 21, first of all, repentance. Repentance towards God, so that people would see themselves in God's light, Jew and Gentile, and be brought to God through faith. Because there is where faith comes in. And then we see also that Paul speaks about his ministry there, uh, that he had accomplished in, uh, in Ephesus. Uh, he had been preaching in verse 24, the glad tidings of the gospel of the grace of God. That is the gospel of the grace of God. As I said earlier, that God would take these people from Judaism, from paganism, from the darkness of paganism, and call them to himself. That was the grace of God. That he would deliver them from the clutches of Judaism was the grace of God. And so Paul did more than that. He also preached the kingdom of God in verse 25. That is very important 
honor the rights of God here in this world where the Lord Jesus rejected. It implies that we honor the Lord Jesus, that we acknowledge his rights. The Lord is Lord. And we say sometimes, if the Lord is not Lord in all things, he's not Lord at all. So that implies the challenge that we would honor the Lord Jesus in everything, that we would submit ourselves to him in everything. He is Lord of all. And we need to recognize this. That is connected with the kingdom. The Lord is still rejected. But the believers accept God's thoughts in connection with his rights. That's connected with the kingdom. And that's an, a prominent theme in the book of Acts. But then Paul summarized also his ministry in connection with the counsel of God. He had not held back anything of all the counsel of God. So that's the end of verse 27. You can compare this four wheels of a car. It's very, very, maybe not the right uh, comparison. But you cannot come with your car with three wheels. You have to be four wheels. And so my point is this. We have to have these four wheels of Paul's ministry together. The repentance, the gospel, the gospel of God's grace, the kingdom, and then the counsel of God. And the counsel of God is connected with the assembly, as you see in verse 28. Take heed, therefore, to yourselves and to all the flock when the Holy Spirit has set you as overseers to shepherd the assembly of God. They have the assembly of God that goes together with the counsel of God. And that is where these elders had a very uh, important uh, task. Paul warns them that even from among them there would come uh, wrong teachers and from uh, outside would come in grievous wolves knew that this truth that God had given there in Ephesus would be attacked. That is the context of Ephesians. Paul knew that this truth would be attacked. Now he is not in Jerusalem. He is now in Rome as a prisoner. And so when he writes this epistle to the Ephesians about five years later, after he was uh, taken captive in Jerusalem, that's a long story in itself that I cannot summarize now, but that is important to see that it is after... <coughs> Paul was rejected by the Jews after he had been brought as a prisoner to Rome. He was a prisoner of Christ. That's how he calls himself. He was in bondage. He refers to that in Ephesians 4 and also in Ephesians 6 for the interest of the Lord Jesus Christ. So how he was ready to suffer for the Lord Jesus. Am I ready to suffer for the Lord Jesus? Like many people today suffer for the excellent name of the Lord Jesus. And that is with Paul you see that the truth is not uh, bought lightly. The truth is not something that's very easy. It takes a price. And Paul was willing to pay that price. And now he's there in prison. And from the prison in Rome, he is privileged by the Lord to send this epistle. It's amazing when you see that uh, letter, how Paul could write that. And there's a close connection with Colossians, of course, because Colossians was written about the same time. There's many parallels. There is also differences. In one word, Ephesians, we in Christ, and we will see many times in this epistle, in him, in Christ, in the beloved, in verse 6, whereas in Colossians we see Christ in us. It's not a contradiction, it's two sides of the same coin. And so how privileged we are that we are now set in Christ. God sees us now as in Christ. And we will see more about that when we come to verse 6, but we don't get there today. In the beloved. That's how God sees us. We are so precious to God. We can't imagine how precious. God gave his own son to buy us through the precious blood of his son. To bring us to God. So that we would be precious to God. Because of the work that the Lord Jesus accomplished. Because he sees us now in him. In Ephesians we'll see we are in him. We are also walking in him. In fellowship with him. And we stand here in the battlefield. For him, And so this is the wonderful privilege that we have. And so this epistle to the Ephesians has also a message for us today. It was not only written to those Ephesians. Of course it was written to them. But at the same time, it implies a message for all believers. Jews and believers from the Jews, believers from the Gentiles. And that is where I want to emphasize the word faithful in verse 1. This was addressed to those who are faithful. So set apart for God, saints, set apart for the Lord Jesus, for his interests, but then also faithful, uh, responded to that call. They honored that call. 
they were willing to put into practice what God wanted them to put into practice. And that is a challenge for us too. Faithful means that you are doing the word of God. The Lord said to the disciples, blessed are you when you hear the word of God, right? He said, blessed are you when you do the word of God. You have to hear it first, but then you have to be doers of the word. And that is what is implied in faithful. They were also doers of the word. Am I a doer of the word? That means, am I really uh, applying the word of God as the Lord wants me to apply it? Then I'm faithful. And again, it is, it is in that connection. In Christ Jesus, we have 49 times in the New Testament. In Christ, 77 times. It's amazing. Most of that in Paul's writing. And so here we have this wonderful relationship. We are now in Christ Jesus. A new relationship, a new association, a new position. God sees us now in Christ. In Christ. And Christ is also Jesus. Because there is the man in the glory, rejected on this earth, cast out by the Jews, cast out by the nations. But he is now crowned with glory and honor by God. That's how God looks at him. He is my man. Is that, if I may use that expression. And so now we are in Christ Jesus. We're also in Christ, in the anointed. That's how God looks at us. And that brings us to verse 2 then, grace. In that position, we need a lot of grace to receive God's thoughts and also to put them into practice, to be faithful, as we just saw. And that's connected with peace. There's an abundance of resources in the grace of God that we don't deserve, but they are there to uh, draw from. This is a wonderful privilege we have to draw from these resources that are in God, that are in the Lord Jesus, grace upon grace. And we see that already in John 1. Grace upon grace. Grace is a limitless resources available for us, an abundance of resources. Are we really drawing from these resources? And peace is not only here, peace with God. It is the peace that comes from God. God who has accepted the work of Christ. God is now sending a message of peace. Not only that. He wants us to be in tune with that fact that God is the God of peace. That this peace comes from God. We have this free relationship, this wonderful relationship with this God. And from him we receive grace and peace. Grace for every chance. Peace for every situation. The peace that passes understanding. And so these wonderful resources are repeated here at the beginning of this epistle. And they are there for every verse. They are there for every situation. The resources come from God our Father. In Ephesus, they honored Diana as the great goddess. And also today people don't want to speak about the Father idea. They want a goddess. But here we have God's idea. God is the Father. The Father of our Lord Jesus as a man. He's also the father of Jesus, the eternal son. We see more about that in Ephesians 3. But he is the father of the Lord Jesus. You see the Lord Jesus now in heaven. God is his father. And we'll see more about that in Paul's prayer in Ephesians 1 later on. So these are the resources that come from God and also from our Lord Jesus Christ, who is now there at God's right hand. How blessed are we to have these resources and to have this relationship with the Father and with the Lord Jesus as a man in the glory. And that brings us to verse 3 then. There is this abundance of blessing. But not only abundance of blessing, it implies a response. You see, in this one verse 3, we have three times a reference to that root. Blessed, and then who has blessed us with all spiritual blessing. In the King James, it blessings, but it is really in the singular. It is one package of blessing. God has blessed us with all spiritual blessing. And I hope to say a bit more about that. And now we can bring blessing to God. We can speak well of God. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ means I exalt Him. I praise Him. I lift Him up. I honor Him. This is a very high word. The blessed is a word that is used for the Lord Jesus. It's used for God. And this is how Paul starts this. A very high note to bring blessing to God. And see, that is really what God wants. 
He has blessed us. So the blessing came down from heaven to us where we, where we are. And then the blessing goes back to God. I was reminded of what the Lord explained to the woman at the well in John 4. In John 4, the Lord was speaking to the woman at the well about the water that he would share. A wonderful blessing. And he connected with eternal life. And I want to say about that also something. In John 4, the Lord speaks about that water that he had for the woman to take and to drink. This abundance of water. And he says in verse 13, Whosoever drinks of this water, that is normal water, will thirst again. But verse 14, But whosoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. So the Lord Jesus has a spring in himself from where he can give that water. And then he says in the middle of verse 14, But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into eternal or everlasting life. So the water that the Lord Jesus gives becomes a well in itself, a spring from where it goes back to its origin, to eternal life. What we see here is this. From eternal life comes this blessing and then in worship it goes back to its source. And that's exactly what we have in Ephesians 1 verse 3. The blessing came from God the Father and came from the Lord Jesus there in, at God's right hand. But now it goes back in worship. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So there you see this circle. Blessing come from above and now blessing goes back in worship and adoration. And this is what God is looking for. He looks for a response. He didn't get that from Nicodemus in Ephesians, excuse me, in John 3. The way the Lord spoke to the woman there well, we see that he foresaw that there would be a response. And she, she became a believer and she became also a worshiper to worship in spirit and in truth. And that is what we are privileged to be today, to be worshipers. God looks for that. The Father seeks worshipers. The Lord said it in John 4 also. And here we see how from a woman despised like the Samaritan or from a criminal like Paul was. He was a murderer although he was a very religious Jew, those people who are saved and transformed, God prepares this, this response for himself. It's all from him. It comes from him. And even that it goes back to him is also through him. Everything is from him and through him and also for his glory. Romans 11 shows that, that all comes from God, all is through him and all is for him. That is true in connection with God's ways that are beyond our grasp. But it's also true in connection with God's counsel. What we find in Ephesians, and that I mentioned also in Acts 20, the full counsel of God, it all comes from God, it's worked out through God, and then the result goes back to God. And even the going back to God is also through a work of God. Everything is from God. That does not rule out our responsibility. But that's not the line that's emphasized here. Here it, the line is emphasized what God does for himself and if God produces this from us, it is he has done that. It's his work, what he has wrought. It's amazing. Introduces the whole epistle. This praise, this high note, this doxology, really sets the tone for the whole epistle. All the details that are developed in Ephesians really uh, have this end in view. This result for God. God wants this forever and ever. You know, this outburst of praise will never stop. Blessed means to speak well of. It will never stop. And so God has blessed us. He has introduced us into many blessings. And I want to connect that now with that one word, all spiritual blessings. One. Now some believe that if you go to verse 4 to verse 14, then you have a uh, a summary of those blessings. Now, the next time, Lord willing, we'll hope to start to speak about that. The voices that follow give us the relationship that's needed in order to receive those blessings. It gives us the position that is needed so that we can receive those blessings and also can respond to God. But the point in verse 3 is that God has blessed us with all spiritual blessings. Now, that's in contrast with the Jews. The Jews were used, if they would be faithful, God would bless them with all earthly blessings. A whole list you find in Deuteronomy 28 and Leviticus also. 
But that's not for us. The blessings are here spiritual. They're also connected with heaven. They're here seen in, in heavenly places or in the heavenlies, in Christ. In contrast to the blessings for Israel on this earth. And they were temporal. They were for a time. Even in the millennium, when they will be blessed richly, it will be for a thousand years. But this, ble- this blessing here is for eternity. That brings me then to this term, what it really is. What are these blessings? What Paul presents to us, and we will hope to see that in the following verses, he gives us the, pres- the position that we have now in Christ. The position that is needed to receive this spiritual blessing. But you have to go to John's writings to see what it really is. And I mentioned uh, John 4 already in connection with the woman at the well. This water is really eternal life. This is amazing that God has given us eternal life. In Titus 3 verse 7, I just want to highlight that. In Titus 3 verse 7, Paul speaks about that. Titus 3 7, being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Speak about eternal life in two senses. That we have received it now and also that we are on the way to eternal life. But you have to go to John's writing, and if you turn with me to 1 John 5, in 1 John 5 we see what we have received. 1 John 5, verse 20, we know the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know Him that is true, that we are in Him that is true, even in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God, and eternal life. So we are, we have received everything in the Lord Jesus. We are now in Him, and He is eternal life. So we have received eternal life from Him. We are in Him, who is the eternal life. We are in Him, who is the Son of God. We cannot be closer to God than that. The believer does not become, when he becomes a believer, we do not become gods. We are connected with the Lord Jesus, who is now glorified at God's right hand. And we become his companions. We are now children of God and sons of God. That's the relationship we have. And that's why I mentioned earlier, that's what Paul elaborates. He presents a relationship we have in order to enjoy this blessing. We are now in the beloved. We are in Christ. We are in the Son of God, who is the eternal life. And so we are very close. And from this closeness, we receive then this eternal life. Eternal life has no beginning, no end. We are creatures. We are time-bound and we are. there is always this distinction between God and us. That will never be erased, that distinction. But we have received eternal life. That is mind-boggling. And that is now the point here, what I think Ephesians 1, 3 refers to, that Paul hints to that. Total package, which is called here all spiritual blessing, is not elaborated by Paul. It's elaborated by John's ministry where he gives details about eternal life. And we have this eternal life in that relationship, as we just saw, in the Son, in the relationship that we have in Christ, Ephesians, and that is is further explained in the following verses. The relationship we have in order to enjoy this. But Paul does not describe that in detail. He says we are blessed. But in order to know those blessings in detail, you have to go to John's writings. But they are very close, linked together. Paul brings us to that point, and then John takes over, as it were. And so this is the very high level that we are placed here in this epistle. Blessed with all spiritual blessings in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. Now this is something that is really beyond our grasp, but it is something to enjoy. God wants us to enjoy all these spiritual blessings that are connected with the Lord Jesus. He wants us to go for the gold. He wants us to be occupied and study on our knees these passages in John's Gospel that speak about the Lord Jesus, the eternal life. Also the details that God has given through Paul to help us to realize the position that God has given us as sons. Sons are for God. So yes, we are, as we said earlier, we are part of the assembly, connected with Christ in the glory, we are members of his body. That is a collective idea. Context, we'll see in the verses that follow, in 4 and 5, we are also sons. That is, every believer has an individual relationship with God the Father and with the Lord Jesus to enjoy that relationship, to enjoy this eternal life. 
We are all different. And God has a plan for each one of us to enjoy this wonderful package of blessings, if I may call it this way, all spiritual blessings. So there's no blessing accepted. God has given all. That's amazing. We don't deserve that. He's given all. And so this is how we are seen in this epistle in heavenly places, not for this earth. We are on this earth, but the blessings are connected with heavenly places. In the Old Testament, you have an example. Israel was going to be blessed. They were in Egypt, delivered from Egypt. Then they were in the wilderness. They were on the way, on the journey to the promised land. And in the promised land, they would enjoy the blessings that God had in store for them. Earthly blessings. And so in a parallel, we are now on the way to eternal life, as I said earlier, to be there forever and ever. And in the meantime, he gives us already to enjoy these blessings. So God has accepted us in the Beloved, we'll see in verse 6, and we are now seated in Him, as we'll see in chapter 2. In that relationship, we can enjoy these blessings already in the heavenlies. And that is expression that's used only by Paul in Ephesians, five times in heavenlies. And we'll see in Ephesians 6, it is also a realm where the enemy is very active. The enemy doesn't want us to enjoy these uh, heavenly blessings, these spiritual blessings, these eternal blessings. He doesn't want that. And so there's a conflict. But that you'll see in chapter 6. But here we have the blessing as a fact. It is there, but it is connected with heaven. It's a very uh, wide realm. It is in heavenly places. That's in contrast to the earth. So God sees us now in connection with heaven because Christ is there. That's how God sees us. We are on this earth to enjoy these blessings connected with Christ who is there at God's right hand. It's all connected with the heavenly spheres where uh, it comes from. The Lord spoke about heavenly things in, uh, in John 3. So these heavenly things are closely connected to John's ministry, but also here with Paul's ministry. And it is an, a, a very good link. Heavenly things go together with heavenly places. But there's also a distinction, as I mentioned earlier. So we'll stop for here now. And if you can read the following verses, we don't know how far we get the next time, but it is good to really meditate upon the great privilege that we have and as children and also as accepted in the beloved and then as redeemed ones in verse 7. There are seven relationships that are summarized there in the following verses. And so that's another seven that gives us the complete picture of the position that God has given now to us so that we can enjoy this eternal life, enjoy these blessings already now. So if there are questions or comments, please, uh, let's take a few moments for that. So the challenge is to go for the gold. That's a challenge for all of us. And of course, we have to deal with earthly things, but with the heavenly mindset, that's the challenge that this epistle presents to us. Uh, and it's very helpful, I think, for us, for all of us. When Paul speaks to the assemblies, like in, Eph in Ephesus here, he sees them in Christ. He sees them in that position. And in that position, they need grace and peace to work out that position according to God's calling. But when he adds mercy, he thinks of the person to whom he writes and the position that he has on this earth. And in connection with the needs, there we need mercy. And so there is the element of mercy that comes in. Mercy is in view of the needs of course, the Ephesians also had needs, but that's not the uh, perspective of the message. The perspective of this letter is to see them as they are in Christ and for God's interests, and that's it. Whereas when Paul addresses a person like Timothy, um, and it's also in Philemon, we see that the word mercy is added because there is the focus also on the needs that that person has. So I'm not saying that the Ephesians did not have any needs, but the focus is not on their needs. The focus is on what they are in Christ, and so the word mercy is that not mentioned. But of course, God has an abundance of mercy, as Paul explains in 2 Corinthians 1. God is the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. So, of course, that's available for all the believers, but that was not the focus of this epistle. That would be my answer. But maybe you have another thought. That's, that's proper, yeah. It is a quote from 1 Corinthians 2 that quotes Isaiah. 
what God had revealed now goes beyond what was revealed in the Old Testament. That's what Paul brings out there in 1 Corinthians 2. And he speaks in mystery, the truth in mystery, but he doesn't bring it out there. He only, only mentioned that he presents now the truth in mystery. The Corinthians were not ready to receive the truth of the mystery like the Ephesians. And so I think we have to understand that it takes also the right spiritual condition to take in the truth of the mystery. The Ephesians had been formed in the school of God with the three years ministry of Paul. They were ready to take this in. And even many years later when this epistle was written. And so this also implies then the question, what about our condition? So I repeat the quote in uh, 1 Corinthians 2 about the uh, truth in mystery does not mean that Paul was able to explain the details of the mystery. It was explained later here in Ephesians. And as I said earlier, you have to connect it also with John's ministry, 2 Corinthians. That another good question, and I wanted to mention it, but I've, it slipped my mind, that these three times that it is mentioned, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, those three times are, of course, intimately connected. But in 2 Corinthians, uh, this connected with um, the position of the believer here on earth, connected with sufferings. And in Peter, it is connected with the fact that God is in charge from beginning to end, that God has a program and God is going to fulfill that program. It has a very wide scope. Peter speaks more about the kingdom, by the way. And so it really connects these things together, that God is the one who blesses, He's also the one who blesses and provides in the specific needs, like in 2 Corinthians 1. And he's the one who uh, has a wonderful program uh, as it developed in 1 Peter. So it's the same God and Father, and that is the connection between those three uh, prayers. It is really uh, an outburst of praise, but there's a very close connection, but also a distinction, of course. Peter focuses on different themes, Second Corinthians focuses on a different theme than Ephesians 1. But there is a connection, obviously. We don't know for sure when he wrote it in prison. We only know that he wrote it in Rome when he was in prison there. And that he approximately at the same time uh, prepared also the epistle to the Colossians and Philemon that went together because Philemon took that letter with him to Colossae plus the letter to Philemon. And so in the same time was also written Philippians, perhaps a bit earlier or a bit later. We don't know for sure. And so at least these four epistles were written in the time that Paul was there in Rome. It's very interesting. But uh, this is really the highlight of his ministry, that God allowed him to be there in Rome in prison, and God gave him there this opportunity to write. There's a fifth letter that he wrote, and that's Hebrews. And we know from Second Peter 3.15 that our beloved brother Paul wrote to you, and that is at the end of Second Peter. So that was also in Rome there, because he mentioned in Hebrews 13 that our beloved brother Timothy had been set free.